Keith's, it was reading Keith's book that, that really uh, made me into a playwright, I would say. I did first read the book when I was at university and tried out some of the exercises on, uh, experimented with students using some of the exercises, but I hadn't quite realized their roots in a playwriting group. And then some years later, when I'd been working in theater for a while, I started to reread the book and I realized I'd never read the introduction. And then Keith described this uh, events at the Royal Court Theatre, where I am right now, and a group of playwrights coming together with this young script reader and saying, we want to just have a group where we get together and really find out what the root of our creativity is, how to lock into our sort of creative unconscious, and just very practically getting together and making up exercises. And I realized, wow, all this came from a group of playwrights and their questions. And that sort of was a revelation to me that I'd always thought of them as acting exercises, and, and they're, but they're initiation had been by playwrights. So I started to sit at my kitchen table and use the exercises as playwriting exercises and found that they got me writing scenes that then became longer scenes that then became, eventually became a full length play called Shopping and Fucking, which was the first play that I, I had produced. And I thought, I suppose as many of us do before that, oh, wouldn't it be great to be a writer, to be a writer, I'd spent many years doing that, but I couldn't figure out a way in. But actually, reformulating some of those exercises as exercises for a writer totally unlocked it for me and from then on in I have worked and earned my living as a playwright so I do in many ways owe it to Keith. So taking the book and sitting down at my, at my kitchen table, I mean, I, I tried everything. I tried everything in the book. So just writing very, very freely, associatively, writing letters to Queen Victoria, but giving myself two minutes to do it, cover the page in two minutes. Just that torrent of words, that sort of free association thing, and then gradually uh, the narrative skills uh, th that are in the book, and and this sense that actually within the first two or three sentences. You, you, you've established all that you need to, to tell a story, that all the clues for your story are, are in there, and it's a case of building on them, adding to them, maybe occasionally plateauing a little bit and treading water and then leaping forward, and reincorporating and paying things off, that actually just that pleasure of, uh, the, almost the first sentence is demanding a story to be told was incredibly releasing. I think you do feel when you start, you have to keep on adding and adding and adding more, 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 more. So that, basic joy of, okay, I've got, I've got three elements that I've set up in the first sentence. Now this story is with some steering and some learning of skills from myself, but this story is going to unroll for itself, was incredibly exciting and liberating and still is. I mean, that's still what I do every day when I, when I wake up. I, have, I know that that's going to be part of my day. So I wrote a play called Mother Claps Molly House, but I did develop that through improvisation and exercises with students at uh, Lambda, which is one of the drama schools in London, and then eventually it was produced at the National Theatre here in London. Nicholas Heitner directed it in 2001. One day when I was working with the Lambda students, we had a gorgeous 10 weeks or something where we could just try anything we wanted to do. We didn't even have to come up with the play. The play was the next year. I went away and wrote a play after this 10 weeks. So it was a huge luxury. I didn't have to plan anything. I could just come in every day and say, let's try this, let's try that. And luckily it had a hugely talented group of actors. And so one day I said, oh, um, let's, we'd, we'd read some material and stuff, and I said, so we've got some basic character situation. Today we're just only going to work in, in improvised verse. And they went, as I would expect anybody to do, we're going to do what? We can't do that. And I'd never tried it before, but I'd just, you know, flick through, seen it in Keith's book, let's give it a go. They took to it like that, and I said, oh, you know, if you get stuck, just shout line, and somebody will shout out, which I think I'd read in the book, just somebody will shout out line. We spent a whole day where we, sort of six hour period, where just everything that happened in the room was in verse, and I have never had such a, a joyful day, because it just leads performers to say things that they never thought they were gonna say, often absolutely, when we go through various stages, but you know, there was one whole hour, where it was just pure pornography, and scatological, and they were, but we have n never just unleashed this energy and this joy. And at points, it was so funny that everybody had to stop because we were, we were crying with laughter, but it takes you into all sorts of places. So that was something that, you know, I think I just saw mentioned in maybe Impro for Storytellers or something, and I thought, let's just throw it in today. 
uh, and you, you, it just releases something. And there are some, and then actually that led me to include songs in the play. There's some stuff in, in rhyme, stuff sort of dog roll. But, um, but that, you know, that came from, from that exercise. And I've actually carried on using quite a lot of song and well, now I'm working with composers on operas and stuff. But actually my interest in using rhyme and song and stuff in plays really, really came because that day was just so releasing. I think when I come to write, I mean, every project is, is, is different. And sometimes it is absolutely great to lock yourself away in a, in a room, as, I, as I've done recently for a play that I've written that's, that's going to be produced here. I mean, that was uh, me going crazy in a room for a year, writing, rewriting, 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 until I had a finished play. I wanted to be able to come here and say, this is the play. If you've got a couple of comments, that's great, but it's not a heap of work that we're going to shape shape together. And other projects work completely differently. I mean, particularly now, um, I'm working quite a lot in, in opera and music theatre, and in many ways, the composer is the primary artist. I'm sort of, in many ways, a sort of therapist for the, for the composer. You're asking lots of questions. Try, it's really their psyche that you're trying to unlock. You're, you're writing these, these words, but they've got to be words that are going to create such triggers for them that they can write their, their best possible music. So that's collaborative. Even it's, it's almost sort of, not secondary, but it's sort of supportive. It's sort of a, a catalyst for, for somebody writing a, writing a great score. So trying different approaches and working in, in different ways and different forms of collaboration and acknowledging that sometimes you're the center of, a, center of what's happening and sometimes you're feeding material for somebody else who's the central artist or... I think trying all those different things is... It's just actually necessary just to pace yourself and sustain yourself over a lifetime. Totally, who's that? Is that a quote from Keith? Yeah, yes. Content lies in structure, not what the characters say. I would totally agree with that. Yes, the characters often say, the characters will often tell each other lies and tell themselves lies and they'll misunderstand what's happening. But the overall structure of the piece, the, the, the arc of the piece, that, that will be the truth. Uh, it might not be articulated by, it sh probably shouldn't be articulated by anybody on stage and probably the audience would struggle to at the end of the evening articulate what it is, but that underlying structure, that is what the piece is saying, uh, not what anybody says on stage. And that's quite often, uh, you know, the, w w where, where a new play will, will fall down is the writer will try and cr make these characters say things which are, which are very important and the writer totally believes in, but, but the underlying structure of their piece, as with Keith's example of the gay characters, will often be Absolutely, I mean, I've seen a play here quite recently that was absolutely a case in point of that. The underlying structure of the piece was totally undermining what the writer consciously wanted the play to say. And, you know, it's, I'm sure I fall into that as well. But I mean, I try to, if anybody, if any of the characters ever says anything that I totally agree with, I try and cut, cut that out. I should, I should feel uh, that I, that, yeah, I certainly shouldn't 100%. If, if somebody can say something in my, one of my plays, I can go, I totally agree with you, you're so right. Then I, I, start, I start to be a little bit suspicious about it. On the whole, I want them to say things where I think, hmm, are you telling me the truth? Is that, surely that's, that's not quite right. I mean, that's the sort of territory that I want what the characters to be saying when they express a belief or an opinion. I should be thinking, really? Not, come on, yeah, which is why, you know, quite a lot of naive or political playwriting is writing for us to go, I, I've always thought that, I've always been right, yeah, right, you know, it's, that's, for me, doesn't make for great theatre. Keith's suggestion that, uh, that one of the things we shouldn't, the, the maybe useful way to think about creating drama is interrupted routines rather, rather than telling a story. It's still something that I play with. So yeah, a, a group of characters find themselves in a, in, a, in a situation and as a way of 
coping with that situation. Sometimes this is a way of passing the time, but often as a way of solving a problem, they start to fall into a pattern of behavior. And for a while, that, that was sort of helping them, but actually often those patterns of behavior stop being useful. They start to actually become uh, counterproductive, and maybe even to us as an audience, a bit boring. And maybe sometimes as a dramatist you go, well, I'm gonna push the audience into that area of, of boredom. But actually, uh, change, breaking the routine, changing, changing the routine, I mean, it can be simply as, something as simple as another character ent entering the stage. I mean, the, the French marked their plays out into French scenes. Every time somebody entered the play, it was, it was a new scene because the whole dynamics of a group of people on the whole will change if somebody new enters the scene. And certainly in a play, if you've brought somebody onto the stage and it hasn't changed the dynamics, then you probably shouldn't have brought them on, on, onto the stage. I mean, there are no golden rules. Sometimes it'd be great, hey, that's brought this whole person on and everybody's carrying on the routine. But it can be it can, can be something as simple as that, or obviously it can be something as somebody pulls out a gun and says, in the next five minutes, I'm gonna shoot one of you. And the routine is you know, definitely entering into a new routine. Their new routine is like, you know, we all bargain for our lives or we all pull straws to choose which one of them is gonna be, gonna be shot by the guy. So yeah, so certainly to look at a scene and be aware of the routine that characters got into and looking for the moment where that routine is going to be broken and how that routine is going to be break, whether you're going to do a very, very subtle break of the routine or whether you are going to pull, pull the gun out. Uh, it's just, again, like a lot of what Keith offers, it's a very, very simple tool. It takes a surprisingly long time to, to actually be able to use it. Um, but but once w w once you've got it there, um, it will give you. It's infinitely challenging and rewarding, and you know I think Keith said that you could you could just carry on writing forever like that. I think he called it wallpaper drama. That, that you could actually write something that was. 40, 50, 60 hours long just by breaking routines. It wouldn't. Nobody would really want to see it, but it's quite nice to think if you're not having a great day, but you feel better just to have covered the pages. It's it's a nice baseline to go. Well, I just write, write wallpaper drama today, and we see quite a lot of it on TV soap opera. Breaking the routine can take you up to the great heights of Chekhov or something like that. You see it all the time. Practically every beat of Chekhov is about. Breaking, breaking a routine, but it can, it can just keep you going as well, just to write some decent soap opera scenes. It's particularly difficult to incorporate Keith into a history because what's, what's, the, what's his job title? I suppose nowadays we might say animateur or something. I mean, he was in this building reading scripts, running a writer's group, directing Sunday night play readings. There, there were specific tasks, and yet you feel it was also just his energy, his spirit, his questioning. I think because the Royal Court has the, defined itself as a writer's theater, so when the history comes to be written, and there's only a certain number of pages in which to, which to tell that history, it has tended to be almost exclusively a history of, the, of those playwrights, and it's tended to be a narrative that starts with look back in anger as a sort of defining text, and then almost how every play, that building up a sort of canon from uh, look back in anger. So I think a lot of work that was improvised or just different in some way has, has been left out of that history. I mean, in this building began the Rocky Horror Show, and in, I think for most people, that's something that in a million years they wouldn't associate with, with the Royal Court. But it started upstairs. It was so successful that it moved down the road to an old cinema and then to Broadway, Hollywood, Bula, beyond, and, it's, it, and to fancy dress parties around, around the world. So I don't think it's, I don't think there's a particularly, uh, I don't think Keith, Keith's been picked out for, for exclusion. I think when I came to write, partly because you know my writing was so inspired by, by, by Keith, I think I had some questions about 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 that royal court legacy. I think it, I think, as a legacy, it, it was quite a somber one. Uh, uh, in, it had become quite puritan, almost sort of anti-theatrical in in the wider sense. Um, so it sort of favoured, on the whole quite direct sort of socio-political comment. And I think I was a little bit aware of that as a playwright. 
And I think it wasn't very good at incorporating a gay sen sensibility. It was quite a sort of macho tradition, really. So I think sort of as a gay writer, I wasn't quite sure how I, how I, how I felt about that. And actually there's a really nice moment in Keith's book where he said as a script reader, he was reading a lot of plays about gay characters and obviously it was, you know, uh, pre uh, change of legislation, but lots of people were sending in scripts in which uh, gay characters were introduced, but by the end of the play, they killed each other or killed themselves. Uh, and it, Keith said the writers felt that they were writing pro gay plays, but that actually the shape of the play meant that these gay characters always ended tragically. And Keith said if he, he felt at the time, in the late 50s, if he ever wrote a play about gay men, they would end very happily. They would sail off into the sunset in love. And, and so, in, you know, he's very sort of forward thinking uh, in that way. Uh, but actually, that would, you know, from the sort of plays that were being read at the Royal Court, that, that was sort of almost inconceivable that actually something could, <laughs> two gay characters could have, have a happy ending. So I think in some ways, even though I was coming to writing sort of almost 40 years after Keith read those plays with, with gay characters, I still sort of felt, yeah, that, that the Royal Court, the basic dialogue was quite heterosexual male and quite left-wing heterosexual male, and I wasn't sure quite how I sat with it. So I think I came to this theatre in which I've had many, many positive experiences, but I came to it with, with, with some questions and, and some uncertainties, and, and, some of, and I think some of that from having started my work using a sort of Keith Johnston approach to the work. Keith has really asked very, very profound and basic questions about, well, about the nature of being a human being and then the nature of being a teacher, being a student, and then the nature of creativity and the artist. So they are questions that are bigger than the, the theatre. I mean, I think they're very good questions for the, the for the theatre to ask. But yeah, it feels as though one theatre and one theatre structure uh, wasn't was too small for Keith to, to ask to ask all those questions. But I I hope that his the <clears throat> that his questions and his, some of his answers and his legacy continue to be explored. Um, because I think, yeah, he's uh, he's asked those very profound questions and come up with some some great answers that then lead you and lead you to further questions. So I think not only are those questions and some of the methodology and exercises and that that that, that Keith has attempted and sketched out, they're, they're not only bigger than a theatre building, but they're bigger than Keith as well. So I. So I think there's a whole way of approaching learning and creativity. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've come across anybody who feels as though they've, they've touched the raw nerve of those things as much as, as, as Keith has. So, uh, yeah, I hope people carry on exploring all those things. And, you know, I, I, I felt when I met him that, yes, this certainly wasn't a a person who was sitting uh, still and sitting comfortably. He still had lots of questions. Um, so I don't think he would say that it's a, it's a closed book and a set of, set of rules. Uh, it's, it's a set of questions with some provisional answers that open up other questions. Hopefully, I think there's, there's a legacy there that should be passed on and on and on.